well, uh, so uh, hello. Yeah, we can begin now. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, I'm happy to start the second part of our lecture series. So today, the lecture will be somewhat very different from the two preceding ones and from the last ones, because I want to focus, as I promised, on one particular case. Uh, the case is uh, one particular group. Uh, it is uh, oh, oh, uh, it is PSL two C. Well, uh, but uh, in spite of the fact that we we shall talk about one group only. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, maybe the amount of material uh, which is included is relatively uh, small comparing with the other lectures. I mean that you will see um, maybe a little less slides than uh, in the previous lectures. It, uh, you will see that because of the diversity of material, uh, the lecture is not as easy as one could uh, think. And in fact, uh, as I told you at the end of our previous lecture, this uh, personally for me, this is a tale of one of my failures. And I spent much time trying to solve the problem and uh, I can say I completely failed because some results uh, were reached. But the main question uh, we'll talk about remains wide open as it was uh, a decade ago. But once again, uh, on the one hand, uh, you will see many different approaches. Uh, you will see how many different branches of mathematics interact here, which is good in its own right. And also maybe it will be a sort of motivation for sort of challenge for those of you who like challenging problems to uh, try to look uh, at the problem using some completely different viewpoint. Uh, it's not impossible. We'll discuss this uh, today, because one of the most recent contributions, uh, which refers to this year, indeed uh, uses some uh, new viewpoint and um, some new partial results were obtained on these new uh, ways. Um, so there is a place for uh, enthusiasts. Well, let's uh, go ahead and uh, let's. Uh, refresh our memory uh, concerning the questions we are asking. This is our main question. So we start with any non-trivial word in any number of letters, D. We consider the corresponding word map on this group. Uh, I remind you that the word map is just uh, the evaluation. This means that uh, we take a d-tuple of elements of our group, we substitute them uh, into our W, we perform all operations we see, inversions and multiplications, and as a result, we obtain a new element of the same group. And in this way, we get a map, which is not a homomorphism, just a map. And the question is whether this map is uh, surjective. So in other words, in simple-minded uh, uh, language, this means that any word equation in two by two matrices, well, modulo center is solvable with given right hands. And uh, well, uh, 
uh, y y psl2 uh, uh, because uh, sometimes we shall also consider another version of this question uh, we replace psl2 with sl2 so we allow central elements but we consider only non-power loops and uh, we uh, ask ourselves whether the corresponding map is subjective. Why so? Because uh, we know that power maps uh, make a problem. Say squaring map uh, on SL2C is not subjective. Uh, but uh, mm, this was discussed during our first lecture. And uh, uh, also, uh, we discussed that uh, power words make problems for many other types of algebraic groups. So not that uh, should they be excluded from consideration, but they uh, are to be considered uh, separately. And one of the courses, uh, I think fourth, the forthcoming course, will be uh, uh, dedicated to this uh, fascinating case. So in all situations we discussed today, we uh, will assume, unless stated otherwise, that our word is uh, a subjective. You know, here, uh, uh, there are also restrictions because, well, in fact, there is a subtle difference between these two versions uh, related to the representation of the central element of our group. This group has only one uh, central non-identity element as a single W value. And in fact, this is not always possible. Uh, I'll tell something uh, in a few minutes. So the first version is, of course, uh, more correct. And it is a particular case of the question we discussed uh, during our first lecture. So we'll restrict our attention to PSL2. So here is this recollection that the squaring is not subjective. For those of uh, you who <laughs> forgot this, uh, you can uh, go back to the slides of the first lecture and uh, refresh, uh, refresh this. Well, let's go ahead. Uh, before considering uh, the general situation, uh, first, uh, as usual, some warm up, uh, which consists in considering several uh, totally obvious cases, um, but they should be taken into account because, well, they're obvious after you consider them, maybe they, it's not completely obvious at the beginning. So, uh, we consider now, again, once again, the power word, x to the power n, and is, of course, non-zero because the trivial word doesn't deserve consideration. And we mentioned that this, this word is surjective on PSL2C. Let me give you one of possible proofs, so which is relevant, in effect. Uh, it uses some uh, more or less general principle, which will be discussed later. So uh, the argument uh, I wrote here is as follows, that we want to extract nth roots yeah, from matrices, uh, modular center, say we allow ourselves to change sides, multiplying by minus identity. And uh, in fact, it is very easy to extract roots both from the semi-simple matrices and unipotent matrices. 
Why it is easy? In fact, for different reasons. Say, let's first consider semi-simple. Semi-simple, I remind you, means diagonalizable, as we teach in the first year linear algebra. But diagonalizable can be replaced here with diagonal. Why? Because we already discussed uh, that the image of the word map is invariant under conjugation. So in fact, we consider conjugacy classes rather than individual elements. So we can assume that our matrix is diagonal. And if you have a diagonal matrix over complex numbers, of course, you can extract uh, roots of any degree from any diagonal entry. And this way, you get the nth root. In fact, many of them, but at least one is enough for any diagonal matrix. Okay. Now, let's consider unipotent matrices. So it's 1a, 0, 1. a is some complex number. And uh, you just divide a over n. And uh, this gives you the nth root of your upper triangular, upper unit triangular matrix. The argument is different. So you do not want to uh, extract root from the complex number, but you want to divide a complex number by some integer, which is also possible. So you see, uh, the argument is very simple, but in fact, uh, it's important to notice that we consider separately semi-simple matrices and unipotent matrices. And the final argument, that every element of PSL is either semi-simple or unipotent. So in other words, once again, returning to linear algebra, uh, you cannot produce a non-trivial Jordan block in uh, this group. That's why this case is particularly simple. Okay. Well, now the next class of obvious words is as follows. I consider here only uh, words in two letters for simplicity, but the argument works uh, for any D. Let's write our word uh, as it's written. So as consecutive powers of X and Y, uh, and we uh, change the order uh, of X and Y. Yeah. And uh, Assume, for instance, that uh, the powers, the exponents, are not balanced in the following sense, in one of the following sen senses. Either uh, x's appear with unbalanced uh, exponents, so the sum of uh, exponents is not zero, or the same holds for y, so the sum of j's is not zero or altogether it's not balanced. So uh, the sum of all exponents is not zero. Then I claim that the corresponding word map is surjective. How we, we can prove this? In fact, we can easily reduce the situation to the previous case of the power map. How? Uh, just continue. Uh, by substituting, in the first case, we substitute y equals 1, you get x to some non-zero power, or you substitute x equals 1, you get y raised to some non-trivial non-zero power, or uh, put y equals x, and you get x to the power equal, which is equal to the sum of exponents. And if the sum is not zero, once again, we come back to the power map, which as we proved at the beginning of the slide is subjective. So these cases are totally obvious. In particular, the last situation uh, allows us to exclude all words except for products of commutator. 
So we can assume that W belongs to the first derived group of our free group. Because the derived group uh, is uh, mm, consists of the products of commutator and uh, the exponents are balanced here. Yeah. Otherwise, it is not. I did not write here F2 because as I told you for FD, the argument is uh, completely uh, the same. So this is, uh, once again, is totally obvious, but, uh, but important. This allows us to exclude many words, say positive words, if you are given the word like x to the power 2021 times y to the po power 2022, you can, without any computation, tell that it is a surjective, a surjective map. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe if you have any questions, please go ahead. So far, it's not hard, of course. The hard part is to begin right now. Even uh, in the case of what I call toy model, we uh, go over to consider some not completely trivial thing, angular words. So you have any some question? Uh, yes, sir. If all these sums are zero, how you are concluding that uh, W is a product of commutators? Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, mm, what is a, a derived subgroup? Derived su subgroup of any group G, by definition, uh, is generated by uh, commutators. It's the definition of the derived subgroup, yeah? So if you, uh, in fact, you, you can uh, um, say even more, it will be told the end of today's lecture, that you can explicitly write down uh, the uh, set of generators of this derived subgroup. Uh, it is known. Uh, there, there is something to prove here, but you can prove that it is uh, generated by commutators of the form x to some power, comma y to some power. In, in particular, there is something which may, which may look counterintuitive that uh, this derived group is not finitely generated. You see, our free group saying two letters is finitely generated by two letters, X and Y, yeah? But if you consider all possible commutators, it is not. One can prove this requires some work that if you consider commutators of the form X to the power M comma Y to the power N, uh, this is a set of generators and because M and N run over all integers, uh, you have infinite number of such commutators and one can prove that they are independent. I think that the best source for uh, looking at precise, concise proofs of this statement is a monograph of Dan Siegel, which uh, is entitled just Woods of Cambridge University Press. You can look there with all basic facts concerning the free group which are relevant for our story. I hope I answered your question. So uh, we consider now some special class of words. So it's uh, some generalization of single commutator. I'll say something about single commutators in a minute. And here we iterate it. Say x comma y, once again y, once again y. And here as subscript denotes the number of commutator and we call this an angle word. Uh, maybe it's worth uh, noting why we call it an angle word. In fact, angle considered them 
in the frame of his work on uh, regroups. Uh, he uh, and uh, on the algebras, which were in the embryonal state there. And in fact, these words uh, allow us to characterize uh, new potent Lie algebras. Uh, say, there is a theorem due to Engel that a Lie algebra, well, finite dimensional Lie algebra, is nilpotent if and only if one of such words is an identity is identically zero on this algebra. And there is a, a later analog of this statement due to Zorn, uh, maybe not so wide known. Everybody knows Zorn's lemma, but uh, much less people are aware of Zorn's theorem about angular words. If you consider the same question of characterization of finite nilpotent groups, then you can use these group words, which we call angular words, to characterize finite nilpotent groups. Namely, a group G, finite group G is nilpotent if and only if for some N, this word is identically one on this group. This is Zorn's theorem. By the way, it gave rise to a similar question for finite solvable groups. Um, can one obtain similar characterization of finite solvable groups? And uh, this was another problem, the difficulty of which I underestimated. And uh, I, with my collaborators, spent well, I think good uh, four or five uh, years to um, solve it, but it wasn't failure. Uh, uh, to the contrary, the um, proof was <clears throat> very satisfactory for me. It was very difficult, but also satisfactory from the point of view that it unified many different branches of mathematics, say finite groups, finite solvable groups, simple groups, uh, um, some computer algebra, some arithmetic geometry, including many non-trivial parts of arithmetic geometry, uh, such as uh, um, the, some Delin theorems, uh, some cohomology, well, surprisingly diverse mathematics arose there. While I'm uh, talking about this, I don't want to go too far away from uh, the main uh, the streamline of our course, but you will see that similar surprises will appear today, that these innocent-looking group theoretic questions suddenly uh, lead to some non-trivial algebraic geometric considerations. Well, let's go ahead. So this is a word and theorem uh, says that for every M, the corresponding word map is surjective. So uh, it's something very good, very positive. Uh, now let me uh, start, I'll say something about the proof. In fact, I'll say many things about the proof of this fact. Uh, what uh, happens for n equals 1? So we can see the commutator map on PSL2. Uh, of course, this was known much uh, well before uh, our times. In the 60s, uh, look at uh, the PhD thesis by Robert Thompson, which is published in the transaction of the American Mathematical Society. He proved this for PSL2. And then uh, it was generalized in two papers, one by Paciencia and Wang, and the other by Rima Curie, for any simple linear algebraic group over C. In fact, PSL2 here is very important because if you try to do the same or, or 
allowing central elements. So if you replace here PSL with SL, suddenly you fail because minus identity cannot be represented as a single commutator. By the way, it's a nice exercise. Uh, uh, try to solve it yourself. If not, look at Thompson's uh, paper. And in fact, this observation is not something standing alone. It gives rise to uh, more general questions, say, given a quasi-simple group, say, with some small center, can you represent all central elements as single commutators? And uh, the answer is known, but not so trivial. Maybe next time, well, I'll discuss the case of finite groups. I'll say something about this situation. Surprisingly, this gives rise to other interesting questions on finite groups. Uh, for me personally, it uh, gave rise to some work on uh, an important invariant of uh, groups, the so-called Bogomolov multiplier. So it's uh, another innocent looking question, which is uh, surprisingly interesting. But here, when you factor out the center, uh, the argument of Thompson is, uh, uh, well, elementary enough. It's some basic linear algebra. In fact, you can explain it for your first year students if you have enough time. But uh, today I will show you another proof of, of this Thompson theorem, which seems more difficult, uh, but gives rise to many interesting generalizations. And this is, uh, uh, this confirms uh, one of the principles I already mentioned in one of my previous lectures that how can one estimate the importance of this or that theorem? For me, one of the uh, criteria for this, whether we have several different proofs of the same theorem. If yes, it is very likely that the theorem is important. And this is one of such facts. Yeah. So we'll return to this later today. So now about the theorem itself. Uh, I'll give you several proofs. It also uh, um, gives a hint that the theorem is important enough, and that's why I have chosen it as a model theorem. The first proof uh, is historically the latest one. I do not order them uh, by time, um, rather by beauty. The first proof is be beautiful, the most beautiful to my taste, but as often happens, beautiful uh, is something exceptional. Beauty is exceptional thing and uh, sometimes, and I do not see how this beautiful proof can be generalized to other words, but anyway, Beauty is uh, of its own value, and uh, uh, I cannot refrain from giving you this argument. So first, let's uh, prove a lemma. Suppose we have an order in two variables, which is not an identity of the infinite dihedral group. An infinite dihedral group is the uh, free product of two cyclic groups of order two, so it consists of element of form AB times AB times NB and so on. Well, and the uh, claim such a word under this assumption is surjective on PSA. And here is the argument. First of all, according to our earlier remark, we can assume that the word is balanced. So the sum of the exponents is zero. And we need to solve the equation, the word equation with an arbitrary right hand side C. C is a complex matrix modular center. Uh, well, how can we prove that this equation is always solvable? 
Let's plug two involutions of our PSL2. Uh, because they are involution, so the negative powers can be replaced with positive powers, and we have uh, either a b to some power or b a to some power after constellations. Say if you have somewhere a to the power of 5, uh, you just reduce this to a. If you have b to the power 2020, you reduce this to 1, and so on. So after all constellations, you arrive at one of these two expressions. So uh, now we use our assumption and notice that a times b is not 1, because otherwise it would be an identity in our infinite dihedral group. Yeah, All squares are 1, and if in addition a times b is 1, we get uh, that our W is an, an identity. And it is not, according to our assumption. Now uh, we have to extract roots, and uh, we arrive at the system of equations. So A squared equals 1, B squared equals 1, because A and B are involutions. And A times B is something which I denote by C prime. So either I extract the nth root of C in our equation, W equals C, or from some conjugate element. And uh, you see now one has to use some property of PSL2 of C, which is not quite known for algebraists, but very well known for people working in discrete geometry and Möbius transformations. And uh, Helena Klemenko, she is an expert in uh, such things. That's why she knows very well that in this group, every element is a product of two involutions. And we are done. In fact, it's uh, an interesting separate question, how to compute what's called involution length of a given element in a given group or involution width of any group. There are many papers on this topic, and um, it's a fascinating material, both for algebraists and for geometers, but once again, I don't want to go too far away from our topic. So we proved this lab, and now we can prove the theorem. So we, once again, we took two involutions, A and B, then uh, we substitute <coughs> in the first word in commutator, and in the case of involution, we have squared AB, yeah, because A minus 1 equals A, B minus 1 equals B. And now we show that for any N, the angle word, E stands for angle, Angle word is AB to the power 2 to the power n. This uh, can be easily proved by induction. Here is an argument. I substitute by induction hypothesis that EN minus 1 of AB is AB to the power 2 to the power n minus 1. I use the definition of commutator. Yeah. Uh, the next to the last expression. Why so? Because uh, uh, here I use uh, uh, the definition of uh, uh, the inverse element. Check these computations. And uh, well, by induction hypothesis, we get, we finish the induction step. Why this gives the proof? Because uh, we fall into assumptions of the lemma we already proved that it is not an identity of the daedral, daedral group. So we apply the lemma and that's all. a very short and beautiful argument. But once again, I, I 
did not succeed and uh, in say extending it too far away you can apply this to some more words but not to any sufficiently general case maybe one of you will be more lucky think about this idea anyway now i want to give you two more proofs of the same result about angular words maybe meanwhile if you have any questions please please ask me uh, so uh, in this they... proof yeah so in this proof we use that uh, uh, the property that psl to every element is a product of two involution yes 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 so, of course so for example uh, yeah so if i take uh, orthogonal group this also has the same property will this prove what yeah, there are many interesting groups which have the same property right uh yes but this also, so this proof will go through right uh, but here we also use uh, uh something more than that uh, uh because uh um because we want to extract roots also you notice that uh i have in the first part of the proof let me show you uh we used uh this argument one minute yeah we have the we start with the equation w equals c we compute w and it is say a times b to some power l and we consider the equation a b to the power l equals c yeah and we want to consider l fruits of this matrix c it is possible in psl2 as we noticed in the beginning of our today's lecture but if you consider orthogonal groups, uh, then you have a problem extracting roots of uh, uh, even degrees because you cannot always extract square roots, as uh, Stenberg's theorem says. Yeah. So maybe with some effort you will succeed, but not automatically. Okay. Thank you. This is the point where such a generalization may be problematic. Well, but anyway, I cannot exclude that uh, other interesting groups can be covered using this method. Now, the second proof is uh, uh, due to Nikolai Gordiev. And the main idea here uh, to use the same approach we have already used today we prove uh, separately that uh, all semi-simple and all unipotent elements here you should uh, uh, correct all semi-simple and unipotent elements belong to the image of the angle map so and we provide separate proofs for the two cases yeah this is the idea and uh, in fact, Gordiev proved this for any simple algebraic group over C. And in fact, also over any algebraically closed field of any characteristic. See, uh, angle maps cover some simple elements and they cover unipotent elements. So the only problem is with non trivial Jordan blocks. And he managed partially to uh, solve partially this problem for some other type of groups say for g2 but uh, to tell you the truth in general the surjectivity of the angle map on an arbitrary simple algebraic group remains a wide open question so once again you are most welcome but for psl2 it's all we need because we mentioned already that any element of psl2 is either semi-simple or unipotent and that's what we 
Let me uh, show you uh, uh, a sketch of a proof for unipotent elements. I do not want to uh, show semi-simple uh, because semi-simple elements uh, can be treated using in PSL2 using uh, other arguments. But let's sketch some proof here to show you some technique which is relevant here. So we use some structure theory of algebraic groups here. We fix some maximal torus, T, and choose uh, some regular semi-simple element, small t. Uh, let me remind you what does it mean see, in SLM. Well, what's that? Regular semi-simple. Say, so think about diagonal matrix uh, uh, whose entries are all different. All in general, uh, for those who teach uh, linear algebra, maybe they know other def uh, the other definition, which is elementary and good, that the element is regular if its minimal polynomial coincides with its characteristic polynomial. And also there are more abstract de uh, definitions such that the centralizer of the element coincides with the torus, its equivalent. You can find this in any textbook on algebraic groups, Borel, Humphrey, whatever. So anyway, uh, some element in general position is regular. So you pick up some diagonal matrix, you can think this way with a different diagonal entries. So some general characteristic polynomial. Then we denote by U the maximal unipotent subgroup of G, which is normalized by T. Say, so think about T, say, standard torus diagonal matrices, U upper triangular matrices with one on the main diagonal. Uh, U is normalized by T, you know this, of course, and uh, then uh, we have a simple computation for any unipotent matrix. We compute its commutator with T, and we get, once again, because of this normalizing condition, we get uh, the product of U by some U prime, which once again is in U, and this way we get U1, which is in U again. Yeah? And uh, the point is that it's not identity if we assume U non-identity. Because by the way of contradiction, assume to the contrary that U1 equals 1, then U commutes with T, and this is impossible because this would contradict the regularity of T. As I told you, the centralizer of any regular element of T equals T. So that's the induction base. And uh, by induction, we uh, finish the argument. So once again, we get uh, a unipotent element. Of course, this doesn't prove that any unipotent matrix for SLN is covered by Engelwood, but for SL2, it's enough. Uh, because uh, we, once again, we use the basic observation that all unipotent elements are conjugate. Indeed, we have one one on the main diagonal, yeah, in PSL2, and uh, unipotent, then we have something on the right, upper right corner. And uh, according to the Jordan theorem, uh, any unipotent uh, matrix is conjugate to this Jordan block. Yeah. You see that essentially uh, what we use here is some linear algebra, um, which is very basic. Yeah. And we know that the image of any word map is invariant under conjugation, so that's it. So we covered all unipotent elements. Once again, I do not want to uh, provide a proof for some simple elements. You can look at Gurdjieff's paper, but I'll uh, give you other proofs of that. 
Now I want to show you yet another proof. Uh, due to Tatiana Bagman, Shelley Garion, and Fritz Grunewald. And uh, the reason I want to do this is a new tool you see here. It's the so-called trace map, which is a powerful tool in this area. Uh, meanwhile, maybe questions, remarks. So far, no, okay. So what's trace map? This topic is more than classical. It is uh, uh, the method which goes back to the 19th century, no mistake here, 19th century, not even 20th century. Perhaps the first paper was the PhD thesis by Fogt. Uh, and then uh, some famous, more famous uh, works by Frick and Klein. Uh, of course, there are more recent expositions of this theory uh, due to Horowitz, uh, Goldman, Magnus, and others. Uh, so let me uh, summarize uh, this theorem as written here. Uh, the first idea is to embed the free group in two letters interested to Z. That's some basic thing. And uh, we denote by TR the trace character. So uh, what does it mean? This means that we say embed X into cell 2. We uh, associate the X, some 2 by 2 into geometrics. The same can be done for y, and for any two by two matrix, we compute its trace. Yeah, and uh, it turns out some uh, miracle happens that if you have any word, then you can also embed it into SL2, just multiplying x, y, and their inverses, and you compute the trace. So you compute this character and uh, surprisingly, maybe, it can be expressed as a polynomial with integer coefficients, which is surprising, in three variables, trace of x, trace of y, and trace of the product of x1. This is a deep fact, which have lots of applications in geometry mainly. And uh, uh, it can also be used in our set. It uh, admits uh, analogs for free groups in a uh, larger number of generators, but it's uh, more complicated there, and I'll omit this. It works particularly good for F2. So, and also you can replace here Z by any commutative ring with one, so by C, for instance, as in our case. Uh, what shall we do? We consider, here I uh, consider SL2 instead of PSL2, but uh, the details can be found in the original paper by Bangman, Gariman, and Grunewald. Uh, let me, for simplicity, consider this setup. Uh, I temporarily change notation G tilde instead of G to denote SL. So I take two matrices, I compute their traces and also the trace of their product, and I define a morphism by this formula. R of xy is the triple of these traces. I want to bring to your attention the word morphism. You know, it's a very important change of viewpoint, because here, instead of looking at G, or G tilde, as I wrote here, as a group, I rather, I rather view it as an algebraic variety. In which sense? SL2 can be given by the quadratic equation 
A times D minus B times C equals one as a quadric. So we have a product of two quadrics here in the corresponding uh, four dimensional affine spaces. So we have something six dimensional, yeah? In uh, eight dimensional affine space, some six dimensional affine variety. And we uh, mm, map this to onto A3 using this uh, using this map. Now we use the trace map theorem and for any given word we use this theorem to get a morphism from A3 to A3 because pi is a morphism here. Yeah? Uh, we substitute x and y into w. We multiply the matrices and traces are polynomials. So explicitly, this is the formula for our trace map. We use here two polynomials, f1, which is the trace of w, which according to the folk freaky klein theorem, is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Yeah. F2 is the polynomial because it's the trace of another word, W times Y. So we get some uh, algebraic geometric object, some map, some morphism. Morphism is a regular uh, map of algebraic varieties here, just of three dimensional or fine spaces. So you have a collection of three polynomials. In the middle, you have a very simple polynomial, identical one. And uh, on the left and on the right, these are some, you have some non-trivial polynomials, but it's a polynomial map. And uh, we uh, make some, some additional technical step, it's convenient uh, to complete this uh, situation, this setup with um, identity map, to get a self map of six dimensional varieties of products of two copies of gene. And as a result, we get the following commutative diagram. And uh, uh, why after all, all this complicated stuff can be of any use. You see, uh, the point is that our goal is to study the word map W to prove its surjectivity, or equivalently, we have to prove the surjectivity of the upper horizontal arrow phi. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, this is usually very difficult. If you use algebraic geometry, you have some map of six dimensional varieties. And uh, if W is complicated enough, you will uh, get crazy and make your computer crazy very soon. But if we replace phi by the lower horizontal arrow C, it turns out that for many words W, the map C is much simpler than our original phi. And the main idea is to study the properties of this morphism, this polynomial map, instead of the corresponding word map W. Yeah, it's the main idea of this method, which was used in several works. Uh, we uh, produced several papers together with Bandmann and Grunewald and other people using this observation. So uh, one important thing to be proved, which I admit here that uh, the surjectivity of C implies the surjectivity of phi and hence of W. It's not very difficult, but needs some work. I want to uh, tell something informal here. Why uh, 
this is good. Why this is a good idea? Because uh, you go over from group theory to algebraic geometry. And algebraic geometry is sort of very powerful and efficient windmill that greens almost everything. So you can use uh, software which computes many properties of uh, uh, morphisms. And uh, this has advantages and disadvantages, of course. Advantage is power. You can use uh, algebraic geometric technique with all this machinery is extremely well developed and uh, often gives you good results, but uh, it's also a disadvantage as any windmill, you know, a windmill greens everything. And it greens uh, all grains and uh, you forget about their structure. So if you go over from the upper arrow to the lower one, you forget, you may forget some important group theoretic information, which uh, may be essential for our problem. So usually you have to combine group theoretic considerations with algebraic geometric ones to get some uh, meaningful, <coughs> meaningful uh, results. But uh, this works sometimes. And uh, uh, I uh, omit uh, the proofs of Bagman, uh, uh, Garion, and Grunewald uh, because I think it's time to go over the general picture. Well, not uh, the general, to more general. As I told you, the original question remains wide open, but still we can prove something. So what should we do if we are in a hopeless situation where the surjectivity is not known? And, well, we are looking for some fine structure of the image. We search for elements of a certain type, say semi-simple elements, and preferably we want abundance of such or unipotent elements. And uh, the important conclusion from our toy model of angle words that these two cases are totally different and they require different methods as in Gordiev's proof for angle words. That's what we are going to do. And we start with searching semi-simple elements in the image of a word map. It's the first part of the general story semi-simple, and the second part, unipop. Questions, remarks? Well, semi-simple case is surprisingly much more easy than the unipotent one. And, uh, uh, yeah, so let me show you the theorem. Say the first Proof is due to Tatiana Bandman and Yuri Zarkin, and they prove that uh, the image contains every element with a uh, trace different from plus or minus two. So we exclude one, we exclude minus one. Minus one should be excluded because, as I mentioned earlier, it is not a commutator, for instance. And also it cannot cover, this method cannot cover unipotent elements where the trace is two or minus two. Well, a lemma, which is a sort of generalization of, I would say, a fundamental theorem of algebra, that a regular non-constant function uh, on our g tilde m omits no values in C. You know, what, what's said by fundamental theorem of algebra? That any polynomial with complex coefficients takes all values, right? The proof is in one line. If not, consider the difference between your polynomial P and this value, and uh, it must have a non-trivial uh, root if your polynomial is non-constant, right? 
<coughs> the same holes in this setup, the proof is sketched below. It's a algebraic geometric nature. Here is the argument. Uh, so a regular function on the fine variety is just the restriction of a polynomial onto your variety, and we use induction on the number of letters. Well, um, now for the number of copies of our gene. You know, here it's not a word map. Any uh, function, any complex function on our variety. As I told you, we prefer to consider our group as a quadric. It is an irreducible quadric. On the way of contradiction, assume that our regular function omits some value. Then uh, uh, consider uh, the projection to the first entry A, to the upper left corner. Yeah? If it is not zero, then uh, the fiber is just the fine plane with coordinates B and C, because you can express D via B and C and A. Yeah? A D minus B C equals one, I remind you. And what, what's going on? Uh, you can see that the restriction of this map to this fiber, it is constant, yeah, because, uh, well, otherwise it would take all values. So it's constant on every fiber. And on the other hand, you restrict to some orthogonal thing, in a sense, uh, to the matrices of some special form. Once again, you get a polynomial. If it is non-constant, it takes all values, but it emits one. And uh, it remains to notice that this curve is something one-dimensional. It meets every fiber of our projection. So we get contradiction, so our uh, function is constant. Some algebraic geometric argument. There are other types of argument I'll mention in a couple of minutes. Now we prove the lemma and uh, uh, no, we proved only the base of induction. The induction step is easy. Uh, we assume in induction hypothesis that it holds for m minus 1. Uh, we consider the projection. And by induction hypothesis, we conclude that f is constant along every fiber of this projection, as in the induction base. Fix some point. Uh, uh, consider the corresponding uh, product of a point by n, something, so to speak, one-dimensional. And we uh, use the same sort of argument again, that our function is constant on the fiber and on the section. This is the same idea. Once again, I leave the details to your homework. Anyway, it's... Uh, Simple, but, uh, well, it's algebraic geometric argument. You see, it's nothing to, it has nothing to do with group theory. Now, proof of the theorem. We consider, we view our GM as a product of quadrics. We consider the trace function, which is a polynomial in four times m variables. By lemma, it takes all values. And this means that, uh, say, for any complex number, we can get an element with any trace in the image. And, uh, well, uh, we can find uh, that uh, any element with this trace uh, is conjugate to uh, this u and belongs to the image of g. Well, so this, this is a, a sort of uh, elementary but algebraic geometric argument. Um, a side remark, today I promised to talk about uh, the complex case only. 
But in fact, this theorem can be extended to more general ground fields, and I would like to mention very briefly such generalizations, which use essentially similar methods, but of course, uh, what I showed you works only for complex numbers, for algebraically closed field. One can modify this idea and prove the following. So this is a new definition. We say that a field is quadratically meager if it admits only finitely many different quadratic extensions. Of course, C is such a field, no quadratic extensions at all, but also reals and periodic numbers are also quadratically meager. R has only one quadratic extension and the QP has finitely many. Uh, well, uh, earlier we noticed that <laughs> the image of any word map on, in the real case contains all split semi-simple elements. But this can be generalized to quadratically meager field in the following sense. We cannot say that it contains all split semi-simple elements. But we can prove that it contains abundance of such elements. And this is a theorem which was proved by Huy, Larson, and Shelev for real and for P-Ethics, and was uh, generalized by Gordiev, Plotkin, and myself for such uh, fields, or a little more general if we have any field of characteristic zero which contains such a quadratically meager subfield, then uh, uh, the image of any word map contains an infinite set of representative of different split semi-simple conjugacy classes. So if not all, but infinitely many non-conjugate elements. So uh, in fact, we can get as many semi-simple elements as we wish in uh, such situations, which sometimes is important. Um, now, go ahead to unipotent elements. And surprisingly here, the situation is much more complicated, in, even in the case as a two of C. The first remark here is that, uh, as we said earlier, all unipotent elements of G are conjugate. So to cover all unipotent elements, in fact, it's enough to cover a single Jordan block. So after all, you see that we have to solve only one word equation, say given W, we consider a single matrix equation W of x, y equals this Jordan block. Right hand side can be fixed. So one matrix equation. So the setup is, uh, well, tantalizingly simple, you see. And uh, that's why I told you that this is something deceptively simple because, as we shall see later, several different methods were tried here with very limited success. I'll show you several methods uh, which work for some words and give some progress, but the general question, as I told you, remains open. So in the remaining 20 minutes, I'll, uh, in a sketchy way, show you three methods for uh, searching for unipotent elements. The first one is due to Bangman and Zarkin about five years ago, relies on another classical ingredient, the so-called Magnus embedding, very well known for group theorists. The second is uh, based on consideration of the representing varieties of one related groups, also some popular topics. 
in low dimensional topology in many other uh, fields apart from group theory. It's in our work with Gordiev and Plotkin of 2018. The details are in uh, the uh, Zelmanov's issue of Journal of Algebra. And uh, the so-called Wigley method, which is completely new. Uh, and uh, two young mathematicians, uh, Urban Yezernik from Ljubljana and uh, Jonathan Sanchez from Madrid, uh, developed this method very recently. Uh, their paper is posted on the website of Journal of Algebra. I recommend, highly recommend to take a look. It's very beautiful work. And uh, these three methods are different. They are somehow morally related, uh, but different. Uh, so let's go ahead. First of all, Magnus Embedding. Uh, it is based on some construction of Magnus going back to 1934, when he was still in Germany. Uh, I do not know whether you know the biography of Wilhelm Magnus. He refused about this year to become a member of the Nazi party and uh, was forced to leave the university. So he emigrated to the US and uh, started doing applied math. He is more, maybe more famous in the universe of applied mathematicians where he had many important contributions. After the Second World War, he returned to Germany for a short time and then uh, he, he wrote there some more beautiful papers in group theory and then once again uh, returned to United States, continued his applied math. Uh, so he is uh, the author of several extremely important papers in group theory and one of, it, one of these papers uh, introduces the following idea. Say so we start with the uh, free group on D variables, and each generator is mapped onto this triangular, this upper triangular matrix, generic one, say Ti and Si can be thought as generic variables, and uh, uh, you can notice that the determinant is one, yeah, say, uh, uh, you can formally think about the ring of some mixed ring between polynomial and Laurent polynomial, some generic uh, elements, yeah. It's a, a very powerful idea of genericity. Now what? Uh, one can show that this correspondence can be extended to an embedding of the quotient of our free group by its uh, second derived subgroup into uh, the group of unimodular. Unimodular means determinant one, triangular uh, matrices, yeah, over this ring RD. Uh, why, why so? Uh, it's a computation you, uh, uh, it's not so hard to understand why. Consider one commutator, then you get ones on the main diagonal, yeah? And something on the upper right corner. And if you commute two such elements once again, you get one, because the matrix 1A01 and 1B01, they commute, yeah? So this is the main observation, very simple one, yeah? but it's important. So this is the Magnus embedding, and it was used by Bahnman and Zarkin. I uh, simplify a little uh, what they did. So now we consider some field which is of sufficiently large transcendence degree in order you could specialize your generic variables. Say so for instance, C is good enough. It's an infinite transcendence degree over Q, right? So it's okay. 
And you get an embedding of this quotient into the group of unimodular upper triangular matrices over K, yeah? Uh, now, we take some W, assume it's um, a product of commutators, so it's belong to first derived subgroup. Then you consider the projection of B to unit triangular matrix. One can show by computation that it's surjective, it's easy. And uh, then by density argument, you get a non-trivial element in the image. So we have a unipotent element in the image. That's the rough idea for this class of words, which are products of commutators. The computational point here is why products of commutators? Because in this way, as I told you uh, several minutes ago, you get ones on the uh, main diagonal and you can specialize Laurent series uh, in the corner to get any unipotent element. Yeah. So uh, this is a not so complicated thing. Some technical points as their work is uh, to replace 2D with D, which requires some. And uh, if W is not a product of commutators, we noticed earlier that uh, uh, our map is subjective, it's obvious. I uh, sent you to the beginning of today's lecture to the obvious cases. So how, that's how it works here. The theorem says that for any word which is not an element of the second derived subgroup, the image contains a non-trivial unipotent and hence the map is subjective. Uh, the next approach is related to the representation varieties. What's that? We start with W, we consider the quotient, uh, one relator group, so not free group F2, but the group with one relator, W equals one. And we consider the variety of representations of this group in SL2. Equivalently, uh, we consider uh, the collection of all possible D tuples such that after substituting them, we get one. And along with this variety, we consider all D tuples with trace two. Of course, the first is included in the second. So the second, TW, is the variety of all elements such that the image is unipotent. So what, uh, it's enough to show that these two guys are different. In that case, all unipotent elements belong to, to the image, yeah? if not only once. Well, uh, and technically, why this strange idea should work? Because we can forget at this point about group theory. We can look at this variety, which are singular and reducible. And we look at the reducible components, which can be computed, sometimes manually, sometimes using computers. <clears throat> manually, we can notice that all components of the first one are dimension 3D minus 1, so 5 in the case, D equals 2, which is interesting for us. And assume that the second variety has a component of small dimension. Then one can deduce that it is properly included in some component of T, so that the image uh, contains all unipotent. This is the main idea. And now the windmill of algebraic geometry begins to work. 
and uh, the computations are heavy. So our computer very soon was arriving to the limit of its resources because to detect small dim dimensional component, it's not easy. Another technical step we tried to replace uh, this variety by its quotient, by the conjugation action of G, which is so-called character variety. Let me show you some results of this. First of all, we do not know that the converse application, whether it's true or not, we do not know whether this method is indeed necessary, but uh, the words are like this. Some of them are already covered by the Bahn-Manzartian theorem, but also some new ones. Here is an example, which are from the second derived center. Let me briefly show you uh, the last method. I'll show you the idea using the example of commutate. I promised you a new proof of Thomson theorem. Here is a crazy proof, indeed crazy. We consider two diagonal matrices. Well, general think lambda and mu are general complex numbers. And uh, we consider the so-called wiggle map. We start spoiling our commutator by conjugating the second variable y by, uh, by g. So uh, any element g goes to this commutator. Now let's compute this uh, for any matrix. So just straightforward computation. Here we compute trace. So morally, the, their method is related to the trace method discussed earlier. Now, uh, assume that lambda and mu are not plus minus one. Then we want to know when the trace is equal to two. It happens when B and C, their product are such that the product is either zero or minus one. Then we explicitly in a straightforward way compute the right corner entry of the image. You see an explicit formula and it turns out that we want to get something non-zero. And uh, this happens if uh, BC, for instance, is minus 1 divided by 1 minus mu square, and it is possible by making some explicit choice. So here is this explicit solution. So we see that uh, the image contains a non-identity element of trace 2, and this is what we need. So surprisingly uh, efficient proof, though not straightforward at all. But it turns out that this can be generalized. I'll very briefly mention how. We consider the same idea of wiggling, of spoiling our word map by conjugating using the matrix G. Then, well, you have to look at the original paper. They show that this map can be expressed in some normal form in terms of two matrix polynomials in the variable B times C as in this example. Then they uh, use some non-trivial observations. Uh, they use some recursive formula for computation of this polynomial. And then they notice some symmetry of these polynomials. And one reduction more, they reduce matrix polynomials to ordinary polynomials. So after all, you have to find the particular root of a single polynomial, exactly as in this elementary example of commutator. And it's related somehow to the trace polynomial in the method of Bandman, Schilling, and Grunewald, by Bandman, Gurion, and Grunewald. 
Everything is completely general up to now. But to make it explicit, uh, in fact, they uh, succeeded only for some particular class of words, the generators of the second derived subgroup. So it's beyond uh, the work of Bandman and Zarkin, yeah? But not general. They can prove the surjectivity for the generators of the second derived subgroup, but one cannot deduce the surjectivity on generators. We cannot deduce from, the, from this the surjectivity of all second communities. That's uh, how it worked. Of course, it's hand waving here. You have to look at the work, which is a very heavy computational contains some computer calculations, but it uses some new idea. This wiggling idea is completely new, uh, completely crazy, I could say, uh, but somehow it works. And to finish, let me show you one more completely new idea, which allows one to produce a uh, Subjective words in higher derived subgroups. In fact, as deep as we wish in any derived subgroup uh, on the derived series of the free group. This is a work uh, by Gnutov and Gordiev from a year ago. Uh, I'll be very brief and uh, I'll give more details. Uh, on the method uh, during our last lecture. So they developed a method for producing infinitely many subjective words. So for each I, they produce recursively a subjective word. Explicitly, here is a formula. If you start from some double commutator, as in Isernik Sanchez, for instance, uh, some non-power in the composable subjective word, then they use recursion, as written here, <coughs> and show that it's again a non-power and the composable and subjective. This way, you can get a subjective uh, word as deep as you wish in the derived series of the free group. The method of proof is completely new. Uh, because it relies on using words with constants. Maybe you remember during our first lecture, I promised you to consider only words with where the constant appears on the right-hand side, but not on the left-hand side. Here, Gnutov and Gordiev have to use more general words, words with constants, and it's uh, another uh, side of the story about word maps, but uh, the time is over, as in 1001 night, and I'll continue this story next week. Also, I'll tell something about the finite group case and about some other open problems, uh, so I have to stop right now, and you are welcome to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. It's uh, not an easy lecture, I understand. We considered yeah. one concrete example, and you see how diverse uh, is uh, this story, that many different uh, methods are used here. And well, for me, this makes the problem beautiful and attractive on the one hand, but um, on the other hand, uh, it's a risky business. I um, showed you that, uh, well, if uh, some of you are enthusiastic, take into account all, all risks that the general problem may turn out to be difficult. Yeah. Well, um, if there are no questions, so once again, you are welcome to ask them in written form. 
between the lectures and uh, our last meeting is in a week. Yeah, sure. Bye for now.